were at the St Mary's Stadium, home of Southampton Football Club. And there at the entrance, Ted Bates, Mr Southampton, so called because under his management, the club rose from the lowly third division to the first in 1966. The club made it through to the FA Cup final on four occasions, once as winners. This was in 1976 when the Saints created one of the biggest shocks in the history of the FA Cup final by beating Manchester United 1-0 to win their first major trophy. United had finished third in the first division that season, while Southampton had finished sixth in the second division. Southampton have had many great players. Terry Payne holds the club's appearances record of 713. An England international, he was in the squad that won the 1966 World Cup. Mick Shannon is the club's top goal scorer. 185 goals in 510 games between 1964 and 1977. He played 46 times for England. Matt Letissier, another Southampton legend, achieved the distinction of being the first midfielder to score 100 goals in the FA Premier League. He played for the Saints from 1986 to 2002. In August 2001, after more than 100 years of playing at the Dell, Southampton Football Club marked the opening of their new stadium in a friendly match against Spanish side Espanyol. The stadium's name was St Mary's. A significant choice of name because the club had been formed at St Mary's Church. It had played under the St Mary's name for 12 years and the nickname, the Saints, comes from the Saint in St Mary's. Symbolically, we can see the spire of St Mary's from the ground. This is where it all began. As the Mother Church of Southampton, St Mary's has always enjoyed considerable prestige, being used for important functions such as the induction of the mayor. But around the time the football club was born, its parish included many slums where some of Southampton's most socially deprived people lived. The rector during that period was Basil Wilberforce. He was to become Southampton Football Club's first president. He was born in 1841 into an illustrious family. His grandfather was William Wilberforce, who led the movement that brought about the abolition of the slave trade. And he was the godson of Queen Victoria. Wilberforce came to St Mary's in 1871 at the age of 30. The vast majority of his parishioners were very, very poor and deprived. But a significant number of his congregation were wealthy people who lived outside the area. It was not uncommon in Victorian times for the privileged to worship at and serve in a church in a deprived area. The sense of mission among the respectable to the poor was very strong. Of course, not everyone who attended this church did so out of noble ideals. Some no doubt came here just because it was the place to be seen. But Wilberforce would have frowned on such an outward show of Christianity. In the parish magazine, he made it perfectly clear what he considered a true Christian to be. Personal fellowship with Christ is the secret of quietness and peace among brethren. In like manner, it is the source of heart rest in difficulties. To be a Christian is not to profess a faith or to conform to a creed. It is the acknowledgement of a close connection between Christ and the soul. It is not the imitation of a perfect model, but the indwelling of a spiritual power. Now, Wilberforce himself needed the indwelling of a spiritual power to help him in his struggle against the enormous social difficulties that he met on his very doorstep. He met with fierce opposition and abuse from many quarters. Brewers and publicans were hostile towards him because of his firm stand against drink as a cause of great social misery at that time. 
A correspondent wrote to a local newspaper bitterly complaining that Wilberforce failed to keep his churchyard free of prostitutes. But instead of taking offence at that letter, Wilberforce quoted words from it in the parish magazine and said, there is enough truth in them to make every Christian in St Mary's throw aside indifference and plunge into God's battle. But in fact, St Mary's had already plunged into God's battle. Under Wilberforce's leadership, numerous organisations were set up targeting specific social needs in the parish. But the organisation that will most interest supporters of Southampton Football Club is the Young Men's Association. It was the cradle of their club. Among the activities of the YMA was a cricket club. By November 1885, its members felt the time had come to form a football section. And they held a meeting at the Grove Street School to discuss the idea. It was chaired by the Reverend Arthur Baron Soule, himself a very keen sportsman. He was the warden of the YMA. The idea met with approval, and so the St Mary's Young Men's Association Football Club was formed. And here, at Hoglands Park, was an ideal venue for training. Basil Wilberforce was invited to become the president, a position he held for the next nine years. He wasn't actively involved in the running of the club, but he did give it his full support. He was a firm believer that sport could be a vehicle for the development of Christian character, particularly qualities such as courage, fair play, unselfishness and self-control. Dave Dewson is one of the club's official historians and he told me about their very first trophy. They used to play here on the common all their matches. They, they had to hire pitches around the ground when they, they, they entered for the, the Hampshire Junior Cup the first year it was competed for. Um, and I think it surprised most people when they actually uh, got through to the final. Played another local club called the Southampton Harriers who um, started life as Temperance Athletic Club. And uh, they, um, they, met, uh, they, they had to have a replay uh, after a two-all draw at the county ground and uh, Saints prevailed. So what was year was that? That was 1888. And that was the first trophy that the club... That was the first club. They won the Junior Cup um, two, three years running, won it outright, and then they won the Senior Cup, uh, Hampshire Senior Cup, this is uh, two years running. And then, of course, things just went from there. Th that's when they started better, getting interested to get professional. Yeah. Southern League started. They went into that. They, they were very successful. They were top three for the first two seasons. Well, thank you very much, Dave. Cheers. It was a very pleasure. The club went from strength to strength during Basil Wilberforce's presidency. But in June 1894, he left to become a canon of Westminster Abbey. That same year, the club changed its name to Southampton St Mary's and joined the first division of the Southern League. Wilberforce was succeeded as president by Russell Bencroft, who served St Mary's Church faithfully throughout his life. Bencroft had been involved with the Young Men's Association from the very start. He was a prominent member of the committee. He also happened to be a brilliant all-round sportsman. He excelled in many sports, not just as a player, but also as an administrator. He also achieved distinction in his career in medicine and in business. And in 1924, he was awarded a knighthood. The club flourished under Bencraft's leadership, culminating in winning the championship of the first division of the Southern League in 1897. But it had become obvious that the club had outgrown its humble church roots. And so the decision was taken at the 1897 annual general meeting to form a limited company called Southampton Football Club. After 12 years playing under the name of St Mary's, the formal link with the church was now broken. But not entirely. The nickname The Saints from its St Mary's days lives on in the name of the stadium, an apt reminder of the historical link between club and church. And on the 125th anniversary of the club's birth, a service of thanksgiving was held at St Mary's Church.
With me is Julian Davis, the rector of St Mary's. Julian, you're Basil Wilberforce's successor. How do you think he would have felt when you organised those two services? Well, I hope he would have been very pleased because when uh, Basil supported the setting up of the clubs, including the original Saints Club, he envisaged that uh, sport should be a vital aspect of Christian life and faith was intimately related to, to sport. And so I, I think he would like the fact that we were giving thanks to God for 125 years of, of the saints. Do you think there are any other opportunities of deepening the links with the saints? There are increasing possibilities, not least because the club has returned, of course, to the St Mary's Stadium, to its original parish, but also uh, as it becomes more successful, then uh, there will be more pastoral opportunities with more people coming into the area. And um, the Saints Foundation is a wonderful organisation which was set up by the club, which has uh, a great effect in the communities of Southampton. And that parallels some of the communitarian work of, of the church. When the name St Mary's was chosen for this grand stadium, the historic link between the club and the church of its birth was publicly recognised.